First of all, um, thank you all for coming in on a, a kind of a very, I think we have to call it an autumnal day um, in Manchester. Uh, my name is John McAuliffe and as director of Creative Manchester, I'm really delighted to welcome you this afternoon. It's really great to be back in person and for the first time in 18 months to be standing in front of a three-dimensional um, crowd here at the Whitworth. A warm welcome too to everybody who's joining us um, on the live stream um, online. We're going to have the live stream will be made accessible as well later this week um, to make this event um, open to as many people um, as possible. Creative at Manchester, as uh, many of you may not know, is the university's new platform for bringing together researchers across different disciplines which involve creative practices and research into creativity. Um, we are looking at work which speaks to and informs the key forces which are shaping our culture and society. And today, to mark Black History Month, our invited panel will reflect on changing conversations about public history and whose voices are heard in that conversation in the continuing wake of the toppling of the statue of Edward Colston at Bristol Harbour in 2019. At a time when public spaces are sites of contest, when the might of the state is so evident downtown today for those of you who arrived um, by train and by bus um, into Piccadilly, with army patrols among the statues of Victoria, Robert Owen, the Duke of Wellington and Emmeline Pankhurst, or nearby Alan Turing, Frederick Chopin and Engels, I can think of no better example of our interest in bringing together research from different disciplines and key actors than today's event. We will be hearing about work done by our colleagues in sociology who lead the National Centre on the Dynamics of Ethnicity and how that work is understood by a range of experts in different fields, history, museum studies, politics and policy, philosophy and poetry. Before I introduce our speakers, I'd like to thank our event partners who have worked with us at Creative Manchester to host this event today. Our brilliant colleagues who have worked with us are um, based at the Centre um, on the Dynamics of Ethnicity Code, at the Manchester Histories Festival, at the Our Shared Heritage, Our Shared Cultural Heritage Young um, Collective, which I've heard referred to fantastically as OSH a lot of times already um, this morning, the Race, Roots and Resistance Collective, and the Faculty of Humanities research team. Thanks also to the Whitworth, this great venue for the city and for the university for hosting our first live event as Creative Manchester. And Alistair tells me the first um, live event here in uh, 20 months, I think, um, as well. We really want um, you to contribute um, to today's event and you'll have an opportunity to raise questions at the end of the presentations um, by our speakers or via the live stream. So do type them in online um, and we'll get to them at the end of today's event as well. We're also really keen um, to hear from you in terms of how you think an event like this works. And as you walked in, you'll have seen at the back of the room, there are two large flip charts and we'd like you to use them going out to respond to some questions about what the issues raised by this event and what it is an event like this can do to um, advance conversations um, about these subjects. We'll also be sending you um, a questionnaire by email after this event and we'd really appreciate it if you could um, drop us a line back with your responses to that form. So, finally, our chair today is David Olashoga, OBE and Professor of Public History here at Manchester. David is the author of, among many other books, the 2016 book Black and British, A Forgotten History, which has awarded both the Longman History Today Trustees Award and the Penn Hessel Tiltman Award in 2017. He is a brilliant and award-winning documentary maker, celebrated for his work on A House Through Time and for programmes. He has been incredibly busy when I look at the work that has come out in the last couple of years alone. The Unwanted, The Secret Windrush Files, and this year, Statue Wars, One Summer in Bristol, and Our NHS, A Hidden History. And these are programmes which um, also 
clearly have shaped national conversations about history and about our future. Professor Olashoga is joined on the panel by Sadia Habib, a research associate at the Center on the Dynamics of Ethnicity, Janine Haig, who is project manager at Manchester Histories, Ray Barnett, head of collections and archives for Bristol City Council's culture and creative industries team, Dr. Joanna Birch-Brown, senior lecturer and co-director of teaching for philosophy at the University of Bristol, Cleo Lake, lead researcher on Bristol's Project Truth, and uh, previously a Lord Mayor of Bristol. And Rowan Hassan, a student and member of Manchester Museum's OSH Collective. To begin today, though, we are going to hear from one of the two poets who are going to address you. We'll hear from Amina Beg later, um, but right now, um, Samia Mudabir um, from OSH is going to kick things off by reading her poem, A World Without Statues. Samia. A world without statues would be a world without your heroism and your false news. My world without statues would be a world without your brave pilots, your grandfathers and your bigoted views. Because you asked in a world without statues, how would we memorialize the past? Well, the people who I want to memorialize do not want that type of memorialization. They want freedom, liberation and no harmful colonial implications. I ask, if my God is the most important to me, yet I do not feel the need to idolize his creation, why must I follow the need for British ideas of heritage and identification? Memorialize the unheard by making them heard and resist the validations of this so-called liberal world. The act of your memorialization is political and I must question the ways in which it is. I want their voices to be heard in this so-called modern state where your false illusions, where your false illusions, your representations are concealing the mistakes of the past and present generations. Black letter boxes, BLM image fireworks, blowing up my hope and creating false gratifications. How can I expect you to fund our liberation when you capitalize off this exploitation? And I hope we stop falling for this the same way I hope the statues fall. Yet I fear the business of our history will make them more inclusive. The business of our history will give them funding to tick off their diversity checks. And the business of our history will tell them to give us a voice, yet make us voiceless. To provide us knowledge, but restrict our minds. You restrict our minds, you tell us to decolonize, decolonize universities and museums that you've left all behind. You rebrand without re-evaluation. Your activism is overbearing in Twitter conversations. Yet I hear the silence in real life situations. Do you want me to tell you I feel more British now in this multicultural place? Do you want me to tell you that my oppression is now over? Do you want me to tell you that I feel safe? Will that help you Britain get over your fragile state? Because I cannot tell you this. I cannot improve your country for your gain. I cannot think of a statue set in stone for my people when your country can so easily make my people without a state. But I will tell you, I won't allow your nationalism to interfere with my beliefs. You can't build us through confined communality. Your multicultural consumerism cannot exist in the minds of critical thinking. And the last thing I will tell you is that your representation, your memorialization is not for me, it is for you. And we are now closer than ever, closer to the enemy participating using their weaponry. Thank you. Thank you very much for the introduction. Thank you very much for the poem. Um, my name, as you know, is Professor David Aldishogo, and I just wanted to set the scene for this discussion. I just wanted to talk for a, a few minutes about the issues that we're here to discuss. Statues, memorials, history, and why and how all of that has suddenly, just in the past couple of years, become incredibly contested in a very public way. It was contested previously, but not so publicly. History Today is on the front pages. Statues that for decades, most people, they're not always, all people, walk past without paying much attention to, are now at the center of huge debate and discussion. In 2017, I was making a documentary for Channel 4, and they were worried that one of the statues that we wanted to explore in this documentary about 
contested heritage and about statues was one that they felt no one had heard of. No one would be interested in and we were focusing too much on this statue. Well, that was a statue to somebody called Edward Colston. And no one's worrying today that the statue of Edward Colston is a local little issue in the West Country of no issue to anyone on the other side of the M4. The toppling of the statue of Edward Colston in June last year placed that city a city where three of our panellists today live and work, at the centre of global discussions about statues, memorial, history, and what we, what we do about it, what conversations, what interventions we might need to consider, to debate, to enact in this country. And it really brought into the open issues and debates that we're here to discuss today. Is it right to remove statues from our public spaces or once a statue has been erected, once it, a man has been cast into marble or bronze, is it there forever? Can we never change our minds or reassess no matter what we learn about the man the statue depicts and here in Manchester as in Bristol as in almost everywhere statues overwhelmingly do depict men. If some statues should be removed, where should they go? What do they become when they're removed from public display? And if they are to be removed, who should decide? Who should be part of the conversations about the future of statues? And while it's important to recognise that these issues are live and current and playing out in the Britain of today, we should also recognise that these debates, these discussions, these inter inter interventions are part of a global phenomenon. We've just spent 20 months in our homes and sometimes it's tempting not to, to raise our eyes and to look more globally, but this is a global phenomenon. In 2020 alone, statues were removed or toppled in Ireland, Colombia, Canada, Barbados, India, South Africa, New Zealand, France, Belgium and of course in the United States, where statues of slave owners and Confederate generals and even, con even founding fathers were removed. Today we're going to talk about what happened in Bristol that led up to the toppling of Edward Colston and in the weeks that followed and the outcomes here in Manchester that might follow the recent Manchester City Council-led consultation into statues and public memorials here in this city. And that is a process, that's a piece of work that is being replicated across the country. Similar discussions, similar investigations, similar audits into statues are taking place right across the UK and right across the world. And that's because one thing we learned in 2020 is that we actually don't know which statues we have. We don't know who are those men of marble and bronze. We didn't even have a central register of the people who we were still actively, publicly venerating. And I think this gets, this gets to the point. What are statues and what are they not? Are statues, as people tell us, history? And is their removal the erasing or the rewriting of history? Or do they perform a different function? Are statues about validation and confirmation? Are there ways our society uses to tell us, to reassure us that our history is good and that the men who've been remembered are worthy of remembrance. Statues are often stranger than we thought. And that's another thing we've learnt since Colston was removed dramatically from his pedestal in Bristol. I don't know if my colleagues from Bristol will agree, but I always thought it was rather perfect that the statue that was most publicly removed, the statue around which these huge debates about public memorialization have swirled ever since, was the statue of Edward Colston. And I say this not just because I live in Bristol. I say this because in some ways it is perfect. It is a statue that was emblematic of the way statues can be dishonest, that they can speak to histories that aren't the histories they claim to speak to. A statue to a 17th century slave trader who died in 1721, almost exactly 300 years ago, he died in Black History Month, thinking ahead. 
was erected in 1895. He'd been in his grave almost two centuries when the merchant elite of Bristol decided he was worthy of memorialization. And those merchants, they erected that statue for their own reasons, reasons that are utterly invisible or were utterly invisible when that statue stood in the center of Bristol. And the statue itself was dishonest in a way. It described Colston as a wise and virtuous son of the city, as if he'd lived his whole life in Bristol. He was from Bristol, most of his life was spent in London. He was wise in terms of business affairs. He made a huge amount of money, but virtuous, come on. But most of all, the statue was dishonest through the sin of omission. It was dishonest about what it didn't say, as well as the claims it made for the life of Edward Colston. It was dishonest because it didn't mention the 84,000 human beings who he was complicit in enslaving or the 19,000 human beings he was, he was complicit in the deaths of. Statues are strange things. They're not always what they seem to be. The motivations behind those who put them up are not always what they claim to be. Statues are mechanisms by which people can be reclaimed and rehabilitated from history. Men from the past who were contested at the time, who were reviled at the time, like Clive of India, like Cecil Rhodes, were rehabilitated through the process of memorialization. Statues are complicated. And these simple culture war debates about our history, under threat by them, don't get us anywhere. What we need to do is what we're about to do now, which is have, have a discussion. Have a discussion about statues, about what they mean, what they are, what they aren't, and what we're going to do about them, and how we're going to learn to live with them. Or maybe not. So I'd like to invite my panellists to come up onto stage and for us to begin this discussion. A round of applause for the panellists. I'd like to begin, and this is, this is no geographical bias, because we have a half Manchester and half Bristol panel. Uh, I think it's only right that the away team should kick off. Uh, I'd, I'd like to ask um, uh, Joanna, you've, you've been at the, the centre of um, the commission in Bristol to look into its, into its history. You've been trying to do that work with colleagues in Bristol at a time when this issue has become incredibly politicized. How, how more difficult are these conversations we're trying to have today in the political environment that we're dealing with at the moment? I think that's such a wonderful question to start with. Um, I think what's happening right now in the political environment is that you're seeing, you know, we've had um, a moment of huge change. And there's a, there's a moment, make no mistake, this is a moment historically when absolutely enormous positive change is possible. Um, but there's a huge backlash, right? And so there's this very, very polarized dynamic. Is my voice too echoey, by the way? No, it's okay. So there's this very polarized dynamic, right, where people are finding each other almost incomprehensible, right? So if you're on the left and you're progressive, you think of everything in terms of social justice and you think uh, it's completely immoral and irrational for anybody to want to keep these statues in place. If you're on the, on, the, on the right, you're feeling like your heritage is under threat. So it's a very, very divided camp. And I think the real question now is, what do we do so that you start to um, you know, understand what the positive intentions are behind people on the other side? It's a really, really radical stance to take, but I think we're not gonna go anywhere uh, beyond these polarized dynamics unless we're asking, what are the positive intentions behind people on the other side? and beginning to have a little bit more of an empathetic understanding. Um, so in my role in Cantor and Colston, um, and now in the Bristol History Commission, I've done a huge amount of listening carefully to what people are saying about the emotional impact that these changes are having, and really trying to think, how do you pave a way for people to actually connect and go beyond the rigid framings that they're bringing to these issues and really tap into more of the emotional core? And just to follow up on that, when you speak to people for whom, I think we need some context here, is, I mean, generations of Bristolians were brought up 
And they were taught at school that Colston was a philanthropist and the S word was never mentioned. His involvement in the Royal Africa Company came as a genuine shock to many thousands of people in Bristol. What, what impact does that new knowledge have on that emotional connection? Or is the knowledge not able to, to reach people's emotional mm -hmm. connection to the idea that this is their history under threat? Yeah, it's great. So when, when you first talk to people, um, like when we were for campaigning and calling for changes to, to the name of Colston Hall, the first thing that people would do is to leap to moral statements that say like, oh, this is erasing history, uh, you shouldn't judge people from the past by the standards of today. But actually, if you probe a little bit and say, well, talk, talk a little bit more freely, then people are like, well, I, I played a concert as a child on the, on the, on the hall, on the stage of Colston Hall. And, I, you know, I, I dreamed and dreamed of being a Colston's girl and finally I made it and I've spent my whole life sort of with this pride in that identity and I, it's bound up in people's positive associations. And so there are these innocent parts of people's identities that get caught in the crossfire in these conversations. And, um, you know, and so once you start showing empathy for that, it becomes much, much easier for people to come along and allow that, that specific critique to affect them. And unless, unless you're showing the empathy for that, then people will just respond reactively and defensively. Thank you. Uh, and Janine, you've been involved in Manchester City Council's and Manchester History's consultation into the memorial and public art landscape in Manchester. Now, we haven't had a, a Colston event uh, here, here in Manchester. Yes. The conversations probably aren't as raw as they are in Bristol, but what, what have you discovered about this um, these divisions within us and whether they are matched by the, the media representation of them, of a, a culture war division? Well, I, I think that the, uh, the Colston um, toppling provided a real catalyst for, for people in Manchester to have that discussion. And I think there's always, the council have recognised that there's always been a sort of lack of understanding around the... Um, the statues, memorials uh, that, that are around. And I think that really it's provided a, an opportunity for people to have an open discussion, for us to reach out to the people of Manchester and give them the opportunity to um, you know, express themselves, their ideas, and, and respond to that. And um, I'm sorry, the, <laughs> I've lost the thread of the question too. You, you Do those conversations were they very different from the, the, the way this debate is depicted, you know, in, particularly online, but also in, in yeah. some newspapers? I think, I mean, the, the results of the, um, the consultation process, it, it was unfortunate really that it was all online, because normally you would be able to do more pavement consultation and go out and visit community groups, but because uh, it took place during the third, um, the third lockdown, and so there was a in total, there were just under 1,500 people responded, and the responses were very... The majority response... You, you can actually access this report online, actually. The Manchester City Council website has, has got the report, but um, I think what came through is that people were hesitant about pulling statues down, but they really wanted the full history to be part of that. If, if people were left in place or you know, street names, I guess, or, I mean, it's a, it's a fuller picture than just statues, isn't it? It's all sorts of things from place names, parks. Uh, people want, there's a real interest in finding out much more about all these people that, as you said, other, under normal circumstances, you just walk past, wouldn't you? It's another bust of somebody that you, you know, it's just white noise in a way, or bronze noise, whatever you want to call it. And I think it, it's, brought to the fore um, a big range of responses. One that I found quite interesting was somebody said that they, they thought that you should, I mean it's a sort of an ideas generating session, but they thought it would be really interesting to take all the statues and memorials away, put them in a uh, museum or somewhere safe, just leave the plinth and see if anybody noticed whether they'd gone, what the outcome would be. and. You know, so and then you get people who just, as you mentioned, that it, you know it's, they feel that their history is under attack. And but it, it wasn't as extreme as you would read 
if you were to just follow Twitter, for instance. It was nothing like that. The idea that the world is less fraught than Twitter is wonderfully good news. Yeah. I'm very relieved <laughs> to hear that. Was Manchester a city that, that, that had a sense of its memorial landscape before this work was carried out? I think a lot of places are surprised at who is remembered and who isn't, and uh, we just didn't know. Yeah, and I, uh, one of the outcomes of the, of, or one of the strands of this commission is to uh, gather up to, I think it's 200, um, this is where I need to check my notes because I've forgotten their name, but it, it's uh, create a new uh, culture, um, oh, oh, it's a, a culture and heritage object review, so there's 200 different objects, whether it's place names, park names, memorials, they're all being gathered together and that's, that's kind of a working process, but I think people were very surprised at um, the, the breadth, everything from Doris Speed to, um, I, I noticed one, a, a street name for Nobby Styles the other day, Collyhurst, you know, it's quite, it's quite a diverse, um, as well as the kind of traditional Queen Victoria statues as well. Yeah. A, a few weeks ago I was at the, the renaming of a, um, a block of houses in Camden in London that had been named Cecil Rhodes House. It was named uh, in 1957 and we looked at the, the council minutes and the councillors who had insisted on that name had done so because they were worried that there was an increasing lack of uh, enthusiasm uh, for the empire. So the idea that the removal of names is a political act yeah. and the installation of those names is apolitical, you can just demonstrably you can see that if you look at council minutes, and we have similar minutes, which are less illuminating about Colston um, in Bristol. Um, but we're now at this moment where we're, uh, more of us are aware of these, these issues, um, and we're carrying out consultations. I mean, the next thing is, is broadening the conversations. Um, Dr. Sadia Hebib, could, could I ask you, I mean, how do we have these expansive conversations about these issues when there is this drumbeat of culture war binary taking place? Thank you, that's a really important question. Um, so I um, work as part of CODE, but I also work at Manchester Museum running a young people's project. And the young people that I work with have been highlighting for quite a while how those um, narratives of culture wars, etc., in the press, uh, stifling their spaces to have real conversations about what these statues mean to them and how they have that emotional impact, um, like Joanna mentioned. So I thought it was really important to set up workshops and spaces that young people thought were safe spaces where they could have real, honest conversations amongst themselves, but also with community activists and artists and academics. Um, so I think, I mean, it's brilliant to have online consultations and some of the kind of processes that local authorities are setting up to, to kind of renew this conversation. However, I think it's even more important that we engage with communities who we don't normally engage with, whose voices are not heard in these debates. And, young people, especially young people of colour, are those communities um, and they want to explore this debate in creative ways and in critical ways. And do you, those conversations that, you, that you've been facilitating, um, Rowan, you've been part of that process. I mean, what, what discussions and what surprises have come out of those discussions? Yeah, it was, it was a pleasure to be a part of the workshops that Sadia was just talking about because as as a young person as part of those workshops it was I have to say I'm 20 myself but one of the first times as a young person within my own city I felt empowered to share my views and to say something meaningful I mean within the workshops I focused myself on Robert Clayton who was a member of the Royal African Company who transported thousands of slaves during the slave trade and the same company that Edward Colston the was same company, governor of. yeah absolutely and that for me was an opportunity for me to explore within my local community because I'm from London why is a figure such as he erected in a public space and a statue in my opinion is something that 
is intended to be idolised. It's on a plinth, it's erected, it looks down on, by virtue of just being there, looks down on everyone else within that community. And as a young person, quite literally looking up at someone like that, I, one, am not connected to that. It's not a figure that plays anything sort of, I'm, I'm not proud to see that figure, in fact, sorry. In fact, it's quite, it's, it's a harsh, awful thing, in my opinion, to see. And the fact that when we're having these debates that are so important, discussing statues, discussing what we should do with them, I think there's a real need to listen to people who are saying, I'm looking up at this statue, this is someone who could be connected to my ancestors, yet there's people defending this individual as representing the whole of history. I don't think history should ever be reduced to one individual. That's no longer got a place. And these workshops were a really, really important space for myself and other young people who really are interested in this debate. There's definite sort of drive for people to be heard, but it's about getting spaces where we can be heard because it really opened up the doors of a conversation that I've never been able to feel like I could have openly before. So it was so important. You, you mentioned uh, youth and, and, and uh, uh, your, your age. These, this whole debate and what's happened in Bristol, it is impossible to look at it uh, without noticing a gender, a gender, a generational divide, a generational difference between how people access and relate to statues and how people envisage them as either totems of power or as reflections of history. Why do you think, I mean, one argument you could put is why can't your generation just ignore them like every previous generation? Why is it suddenly, for your generation, why do these, power, these statues cut through and matter in a way that they evidently didn't? I, I, I was I'm much older than you, I was political, I was younger. I was very aware of statues, no one cared. Yeah. Um... I actually think it's a really interesting question because I do believe that although in this debate our focus is on these statues, it's really about a bigger, wider conversation. I think the statues, when the BLM protests were going on and when Edward Colston fell, that was a specific event that we could pinpoint as something that we can discuss, as a, something that needs to be responded to. The, Pulling down of the statue got a huge amount of media attention, but I actually think these statues, you're absolutely right, in day to day I'm sure we all walk past statues and don't notice them, don't know what they stand for, don't know who they are, even if we walk past them every day on our commute to work. But I actually think the statues were a visual aid for a conversation that's actually about what's taught in schools, racism within the curriculum, racism that people experience on a day-to-day, -day, but the statues have been used as a fixation on conversations that might not have been able to be had because people won't listen if you just say, I think this curriculum of history that I'm learning as a young person is racist. It takes for a statue to fall for people to realise maybe there's an issue because within all our public domains we've got figures erected that are of slave owners and I think its statues have been a way to initiate a conversation that's needed to be had for many years. So this generation in some ways has subverted these statues and used yeah. them to have a conversation which is not directly or fully about statues, but used the statues as an entry point to having these conversations. I often think in Bristol that the, the interest groups who would love Bristol not to talk about its slave trading past must really rue the day they erected the statue to Edward Gostin because it has become the most powerful lightning rod for conversations that had been suppressed for a very long time. I, I'm, I'm very glad you, you mentioned uh, Costin because I think it's worth it because we have uh, three people who were very involved in different ways in the statue of Edward Costin and in its longer history um, is to sort of look at that event not as an event but part of a process. Clear your relationship with Edward Costin, um, the historical figure and the man of bronze, you, that's not something that began for you in June 2020, is it? Absolutely not. Um, for me, it actually started in some ways at the age of about five when I would walk past Colston's Girls' School in Bristol and 
for whatever reason, I aspired to attend that girls' school and went on to attend. And every 1st November, we would, you know, wear a fairly embarrassing hat, source a bronze chrysanthemum, which was Edward Colston's favourite flower, and make our way to the cathedral to publicly celebrate someone who enslaved my ancestors. I wasn't aware of that history and the school made no attempt to fill us in as students. It was only around 1996 actually that um, I think it was around the time when Bristol was having a festival of the sea which completely ignored um, you know colonialism, enslavement and anything that was problematic. It literally was a celebration and a festival of the sea and I saw on the news uh, members of um, African heritage communities, mainly people who were sort of from a Caribbean background in Bristol out demonstrating and saying we want the statue down and really challenging the festivities that were going on and, and requesting a wider narrative that I started to question who this person was and of course took that back to the headmistress who was um, our English tutor at the time and was completely dismissed and you know really it was shoved totally back under the carpet with the people who were protesting described as you know really ignorant and uneducated and all the rest of it so I think it started there um, and you know years later in Bristol we had an artist intervention in St Paul's which is the area that's most connected to the African Caribbean community in Bristol um, with, a, with a long history of resistance and protest there was a mock pirate radio station set up and the artists sort of started to ask about the Merchant Venturers and Colston and I just tipped them off that actually we're heading towards commemoration and that is where some people from Radical History Group, other artists and other community members turned up outside the cathedral with a pamphlet explaining to students who Edward Colston actually was and really that was where Countering Colston, um, a campaign group to dismantle the public celebration and commemoration of Edward Colston was, was formed. And I, and I should explain that um, the Merchant Venturers, everyone in Bristol knows those words very well, are a, a guild um, that will have very strong connections to the Atlantic slave trade and have been uh, pivotal in the 300 years of uh, the commemoration of Edward Colston. Um, Joanna, you have a sort of a, a similarly long uh, relationship with, with, with Edward Colston and his, and his legacy. And I should also explain that um, it's not just the statue. The school that Cleo attended is, was one of many institutions named after Colston. It was 13 streets, even you know better than me. There were several streets, but the school has now been re renamed it to is. Montpellier High. And Joanne might mention this, but I think one of the more tangible things that was going to happen more recently was a recontextualization of the plaque on the statue, you know, moving away from Bristol's most wise and virtuous man. But interestingly, a member of the Merchant Venturers intervened in the rewording. The plaque was actually made. There were several people who tried to input. And I think one of the problematic issues was um, the suggested text, you can imagine the backwards and forwards on this, was the suggestion that actually this great charitable man, this great giver and provider of Bristol's poor, it, you had to be a certain type of poor. So that narrative, they were tempted to dismiss that narrative, that he was everyone's hero because he wasn't. Even if you were um, obviously white, it wasn't necessarily a man for you. You had to have several conditions to actually benefit from his wealth to an extent where some people may not have um, voted a particular way or endorsed a particular um, political want because Edward Colston was an MP and a politician as well, as many of them were, that he actually withdrew a lot of funding from a church and many children starved. Joanna, your, your relationship? Um, with, with Colston similarly, uh, it didn't begin uh, with the statue top. Yes, well, it doesn't go back as long as Cleo, um, but I, I got involved in the, the Countering Colston campaign um, right towards the beginning of that, inception of that. So Cleo and I worked a lot together around um, you know, trying to rename Colston Hall. But one of the things that I think was really powerful in that, ah, sorry about that squeaking. Is that better? Um, one of the things that I think made a huge difference there was uh, just the work that historians were doing. So local historians doing very descriptive history, 
just actually trying to figure out exactly what had happened and then sharing those descriptions publicly. Um, and they were working in the tradition of Reverend Wilkins in Bristol, who uh, in the 1920s had been a leader in the Society of Merchant Venturers and just stopped and said, what is up with this cult of Colston? Um, we're celebrating him all over the place. And he did very detailed work just going through and describing in the 1920s exactly which Royal African Company committees was he sitting on. So these historians now went back and looked at that work, went and looked into archives and figured out, um, you know, just gave people a much more detailed and accurate picture of the history. And in a way, I think that kind of descriptive stuff can speak for itself and can really uh, move things along. I mean, we saw the kind of the power of that descriptive work, but it's interesting that in the 1920s, this, um, this you know, leading figure in the merchant ventures was actually playing a key role in helping that knowledge that, we're, that we've now benefited from you know, decades and decades later. So the struggle, the contestation about the statue was something that went back I mean, literally decades long before what happened uh, la last summer. I mean, one of the arguments that was made by some people uh, online, some, some politician, was that it should have been, the statue should have been removed through some official channel, uh, unaware that there had been attempts, as Clea said, to contextualize it, of course, for it to be removed to official channels um, in, in the past. But suddenly, last summer, uh, people like yourself and Clea, um, who'd been campaigning for change, suddenly that change happened really, really, really rapidly. Um, when the statue was toppled, it became a different thing in some ways. Uh, and at that point, when it had been dropped in the, in the River Avon, uh, symbolically, like a, a victim of the Middle Passage thrown into the Atlantic, this, this edifice, this, this representation of a slave trader thrown into a river from which 2,000 slave trading expeditions set sail from the 17th to the 19th century, carrying between them around half a million Africans into slavery. This incredible moment of you know, historical poetry, many people called it. The person who has to then work out what we do next is yourself, Ray, uh, as head of the, the of, uh, museums in Bristol. Um, what happens the sort of the day uh, after those historic events? Uh, well, I'd probably start with the day it actually happened, to be honest, because uh, myself and my wife were watching the news. When we saw what had happened, it was clearly such a, an important event uh, that we knew that the museum service had to be immediately involved in this. We went down there and started to collect the banners, uh, some of the banners to make sure there was at least some record, physical record for the museum of what had happened. These are the Black Lives Matter banners that Indeed. the protesters have been carrying. You wanted to contextualize the event by gathering this sort of historical ephemera. Exactly that. And um, uh, museums are often very engaged with the very practical. Uh, it had rained. These things are made of cardboard. They're going to disintegrate. So we were trying to collect them very quickly because clearly there had to be something happening here that we ought to be reflecting and the, mirror, and, the, and the museum service acting as a mirror back to the society in the city. Um, but uh, following that, of course, it was the elected uh, Mayor Marvin Rees of Bristol who decided that the statue should be retrieved from the River Avon um, and that it should be placed in a museum. So we took ownership of the statue uh, as soon as it was retrieved. And museums, as I say, are very much about practical issues. Our, our first issue was what what do we do with this? Well, you know, it's not, um, it's very brand new to us. Uh, an item out of a river, usually a bit of old archeology span or something, we can deal with. But this, the significance of this was very clear to everyone involved. Uh, and consequently, we applied our museological brains and we said, what do we do in this situation normally? Uh, we are conservators, we're not restor restoration people, we conserve things. And clearly what we should do in this instance is to take this statue and preserve it as best we could so that it wouldn't deteriorate further. And then somebody else can make that decision as to what you want to do with it. Do you want to fully restore it and reinstate it? Do you want to melt it down and get rid of it? It wouldn't be our decision to do that. But our role in this instance was actually to give that opportunity for everyone to take stock and decide what the next stage would be. So for that to happen, uh, we had to clean all the mud off it and we took the decision to leave the graffiti on it, which uh, some people 
subsequently have complained about, but uh, we said it was the right decision. And what was the rationale for, for leaving the graffiti? Um, from our perspective, from a museological point of view, uh, this is now part of its history. You know, it is now speaking a different story than it did when it was standing in the middle of the city. And that conveys that story incredibly well. Uh, the fact that it was damaged at the base as well, you know, you couldn't just stand it back up again, it'd all be well. All of that, two parts of it are missing and still are missing. Um, so so that's his walking stick. What else, what else is missing? Part of his frock coat. Exactly that. So uh, someone has his walking stick prison hob prison. hobbling around Bristol. If, if anybody wants to donate it to us, feel free. Um, but uh, those two pieces are missing and the graffiti, but also the physical damage from it being rolled along before it went into the river. That all tells a really visible and really strong, powerful story for us as well. So that was clearly what we needed to do, preserve it in that state. And that, 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 that decision that this needed to be, to be stabilised, that the ephemera around it needed to be gathered together, that sort of came together this summer when it went not back on the pedestal, but back on, on public display. And it was in some ways a sort of a moment when this battle about statues suddenly reignited and Bristol was once again at the centre. What was the reaction to putting it back on public display in a museum? Um, I, I first of all say that um, we often count or try to counter a stereotype about museums that if you take something and put it in store, it's never seen again. And we were very very clear that we didn't want that impression to be given out to the public, that we'd been given this statue and we might bring it out in 5, 10, 20 years, who knows. So our ambition was always to bring it back out into the public domain as quickly as we possibly could. And we were immediately um, approached by the groups that we already uh, consult already about these sorts of issues. You know, we'd been our first exhibition about Bristol's role in transatlantic enslavement was in 1998 as a direct consequence of what Cleo has already discussed. So um, we wanted to bring something out quickly. We decided that actually bringing it out and putting it on display would be the start of the consultation, although lots of people wanted to talk to us before it went out, but this was actually what we were going to do, create a display which was as factual as we could make it, as honest and transparent as we could make it. And from that point on, that display there was the mechanism to ask the public what to do next on behalf of the History Commission that Joanna sits on. Thank you, thank you. Uh, the, I should say the panel, we've got about sort of 15 minutes more uh, um, talking, and then there's time for questions from the audience, including questions from the audience who are watching online, and those, those questions will be ferried to me, and there will be a roaming microphone, a couple of roaming microphones, people on standby already. Um, please tell us your name, and just wait for the microphone to reach you before starting your question. Dave, can I come in on the, the please museum do. point? So, I mean, I think one of the interesting things about that is that, you know, we've, so we, we put out a, a survey, which if you want to ha have your own chance to comment on what, the, what should happen with the statue, you can fill that in. Go to the, the Imshed Museum um, website. But It's just closed. Oh, it's just closed. Oh, never mind. Sorry, your chance. <laughs> um, 300 years to say what you thought about Colson. <laughs> just missed it. <laughs> We've had almost 11,000 responses to that. So a huge number of people have chimed in on that and we're now in the process of trying to analyze that data. And, and kind of the aim will be to mirror that back, um, give people a, a kind of a picture of the social attitudes. And I think one of the things in that choice about how to display it was how do you present this object that is incredibly um, intense object? How do you present it in a way that's respectful to all sides? Um, and that gives people a chance to come and see it and pay their respects. And um, I think that display achieved that very, very well. Um, but yeah. And again, it's not really directly about the statute, it's about people's relationship with it, and it's about debate and conversation. And, and I think the kind of key word um, is engagement. I mean, Janine, doing this work here in, in, in Manchester, what, what does real community engagement about these issues? What does it look like? Is it, is it possible? Is it too infected by the culture war narrative for it to be comfortable? How, how do we make it possible? Well, I, th I think the reason that Manchester History is, is, was involved in uh, working alongside the council is that we're, uh, we're an organisation that works 
all our work is out in the community. We work um, either directly with people, with artists, um, with community groups, with partner organisations. We're, we're not a venue-based uh, organisation, so um, you know it's given us that ability to. We're used to working in that way, and I think um, it, those established links really uh, kind of help us get out there to listen to people's stories and um, it, Manchester history's methodology working is to is to create is to do creative pro projects out in the community so that gives people an opportunity to um, tell their stories and a lot of these stories are hidden stories hidden histories they're overlooked histories sometimes they're contested histories and so I think in a way that feels like the, the way that we are quite successful in doing that because if we've got so many links and networks into people, ordinary citizens and also organisations and grassroots organisations, I think it is, it is possible to, but you, you just have to be, set yourself up to listen and to go and find, go and work with people where they are rather than expect people to come to you and so, um, you know, in, in some respects, I think that's that's a little bit like this consultation process. This is, I know that the city council have done the first uh, the first part of the consultation, but it, it's ongoing. They're looking at uh, developing, working with the the um, universities and other partners to look at a really long term education program to kind of uh, support curriculum, support general learning. Um, about our history and, and to really try and get a, a much broader picture really of, of things like statues and name places but also to look at who people think should be recognised and provide an opportunity for that to feed that information back in quite a creative way. I mean we, we love doing creative projects and you know as, as the sort of beautiful poetry and the, the workshops that um, people, I think you, you can include different types of voices, can't you? Young people, you can, um, you know, people who probably aren't used to expressing their ideas about any of these kind of topics. So um, I, th I think there is a there is a, a role for, for creative engagement on a completely ongoing basis. Thank you, and, yeah. and Sadia Habib, uh, your work again. Uh, what does what does it what does success look like? What does create those inclusive engagement conversations? What do they sound like? So I think to start with, um, it's really important for institutions like the ones I work for and the ones that communities encounter to um, begin by acknowledging decades of neglect where they've not you know they've not um, well they've essentially excluded and alienated community voices. So I think. It's really important that when you go out to communities, you've got the, you set the right tone. It's not just a consultation where you're going to be there temporarily to do the tick box exercise like um, Sam mentioned in her poem, but it's actually a genuine space, an authentic space for reflection, but also a shift in power, make, power and decision making. Um, and I think one of the ways that institutions can do that, uh, one way that they can counter this kind of generations of marginalization is by involving communities from the very beginning in any initiative and exercise um, and a really good example actually is um, the south asia gallery which is being co-curated at the moment the pioneers of that are sitting here actually pioneers of the south asia gallery in at manchester museum and that's been co-curated and co-produced and co-designed from the beginning with communities and they're making decisions about the objects, the stories, the collections, the design and so on. So I think um, it's not rushed, it's not temporary, it's not a short term fix. It takes a long time and it's about building relationships and sustaining those relationships. And also um, being willing to give up some of your power because at the moment institutions and the people who work in them don't, they, they cling on to their power and it's very difficult for them to give that decision making to the communities that they work with. Um, otherwise, you know, 
communities are savvy, they're not stupid, and young people, especially that I work with, they recognise when something's just performative. So you will, you will have seen a flurry of statements um, during you know, the whole resurgence of BLM, but people are savvy to the fact that often these statements are performative, and is there real change going on, and is there real engagement? And Joanna, you're, I mean, the History Commission in Bristol has been tasked with trying to find a way to bring a city divided by the Colston issue and the top limb of the statue together. I mean, to, to some, sorry to give you the harder question, I mean, is it possible? Are we going to be able to use this moment and these, this artifact, these statues, to bring people together, or are they going to be exploited to create further divisions? Can we win? Um, I absolutely think we can bring people together over these issues, and I, although I don't know if this is the strategy we'll take in Bristol or not, um, I think there's some really great participatory methodologies that people should think about when they're thinking, okay, what do we, what do, we do if somebody's calling for you know, one of the statues in Manchester to come down? What, uh, how, what process should we follow? I think process really, really matters a lot from what we do now. So, um, for instance, one method that I would really recommend looking into is the use of citizen juries. So a citizen jury is um, it's a great method. You, you basically you assemble a group of people, a group of delegates, the same way that you would assemble a jury. So you're looking for it to be random but representative. And you have, you know, assembling the jury really matters. You've got to get um, a range, you know, people from the different social locations in the city that will kind of be able to speak to different views and the different social meanings. That jury then hears arguments, you know, they hear testimony, they hear evidence about the history of the statue, they hear evidence about the history of the figure, they hear people give representations on different sides. Um, so it's a really important job, you know, they're hearing, they're hearing maybe three minute representations from everybody who wants to come and talk or something. And then uh, at the end of that, they go behind closed doors, they deliberate, they talk through things, and then they come to a recommendation. And if you go through that kind of process, you're going to have a level of legitimacy around the decision making where people are going to say, okay, um, people, somebody like me was in that room helping the conversation along, and I think that's a, that's a tool that can cut through a lot of the conflict. Um, it's almost time to have questions from the audience, but before we do, we have a second uh, poem, and that is read by uh, Armina um, Beg, who if I can find her biography. In a moment. I mean, you have to tell me who you are because I've forgotten all of the, the details because I can't find your biography. My apologies. Armina is a Manchester-based spoken word artist. He says gratefully and poet. She's, but she's currently in her second year studying BA Drama and Film at the University of Manchester. My apologies. No, that's okay. Um, hi, I'm Amina, um, and this is my poem, Britannia. Um, it's based on um, Queen Victoria and Piccadilly and Gandhi, so I'll let you clock the correlation um, when I perform. So, um, this is Britannia. You sit on your throne, arm rested with gold, pearl necklaces carried by blood diamond mold, Algae forms your pristine skin. That was once marble, I see your tears thin. Even if you look up, you fear. The olive skin prophets you airbrush, come on dear, stop using our prophets for profit. Or using our kids to cover you, seven foot state, statue based on hate, race, don't lie to my face. I thought you were all spiritual calm and that. You gave them yoga and amaste and mats. I know what you did to money, you hid it under the covers, doing it for the numbers. Five noble peace prices, we know your secret lovers. I don't see peace when you kick my sister out, out of the house, she shipped to another land. Cause you can be bothered to fully plan. Sip your child acting like the big man, you're just like them, man, batting in her, dressed in rich robes, fake jewels, broken souls. Thank you. Amena, thank you very much for that. For that. Um, we've got a little time for, uh, for questions. Could I, um, we have a couple of questions that have been pre-planned. Uh, the first of those is from Samir. Uh, hello, uh, my name is Samir. I am an artist and poet based in Birmingham. And uh, my question relates to um, a recent consultation in Stroud um, about uh, the Black Boy statue um, on like one of the uh, churches in there and how 
Um, the artist who set up the consultation, Dan Guthrie, talked about the way that when he was a child, like uh, other children in his school would like point to the statue and use it as a tool to uh, direct harm to him. Uh, being like a young black person, uh, statues of enslaved peoples and statues of enslavers is often not just not just a uh, not just a statue, but also a weapon of white supremacy that uh, people use to wield uh, as direct harm. Uh, so my, quest my question to the panel is, how do we address the direct harm that is like being wielded um, against people every day by these statues? And how does that affect like the urgency with which we move in our decision making? Could I channel that question to clear? Okay, good question. I mean, what comes to mind as well is also the education system. For example, you know, um, Wales now having a mandate to teach black history in schools, but it's important to know what's being taught and how it's been taught. Um, and there is, you know, perhaps occasions that exist where when you raise certain things in class, um, you get this kind of bullying and taunting that you've just mentioned perhaps happened in Stroud. I think to flip that though, um, and to bring it back to Bristol again, that we did actually unveil a statue to Henrietta Lacks yesterday, the Bristol University commissioned Bristol-based um, woman of African heritage, Helen Wilson Rowe, and that statue should be empowering for everyone because it's someone whose life affected everyone. So that's kind of reframing of the landscape. But I think how people um, respond and feel is very important in that kind of, um, Things that are usually marginalised when it comes to institutional reactions to things need to be at the forefront. We need to kind of flip that round. And I think um, people understanding that it's violent or people understanding that it's problematic takes such a level of education, even for um, people of African heritage. So in Bristol, we also had a consultation called Project Truth. Um, you know, understanding our tapestry, uh, our tapestry and history, and it's quite clear that we all come in with different levels of understanding, and also the kind of colonised mind and the mental enslavement, all these kind of things that we need to throw off, as well as the statue. There's so much that needs to be toppled, but I think the statue is symbolic. But also, we think about our um, fellow human beings in places like Trinidad, still stuck with kind of figures like Columbus, and we should have really try to understand the extent of what has happened in history, and it's painful for everyone, but we have to address it, or we can't move forward. Thank, Thank you. you. We have another prepared question, which, which is from uh, Megan Tinsley, who's, just wait for the mic, Megan. Uh, thank you, everyone, um, this really encouraging um, panel. It's wonderful to hear about how many creative critical initiatives are taking place in Bristol and Manchester. Uh, at the same time, I'm reminded that there's the national government to contend with. Um, and in particular, within the past two weeks, there's been a cabinet reshuffle that's seen the appointment of Nadine Dorries as culture secretary. So um, with this in mind, how might um, young people respond? How might councils respond and continue to engage critically with statues um, amidst a very different political landscape at the national level. Thanks. Thank you very much, Megan. Can I ask Rowan to respond to that? As you mentioned, uh, young people, there was another gathering, as you may have heard, across Manchester, uh, where a lot of people have very different views about this issue. How, how, how should young people respond to the politicisation of this? Um, I think with Nadine's appointment, I think as a young person, to be honest, initially it strikes worry. Um, she's been appointed as in her role and I upon doing a bit of research and hearing about her I've not reading her novels I hope pardon not reading her novels you don't yeah. need to go that far <laughs> um just about someone like of her who doesn't fully understand what we were just speaking about about people really having real emotion and feeling towards these statues in public places She's made comments previously about sort of left-wing views being snowflakes and people for killing comedy. And it's these sort of people in power who have, of course, power to make big decisions that affect all of us in communities. But then it's again, young people not trusting people in power is a big issue. Not being able to feel that someone's actually listening and hearing 
as that question was just answered, as Chloe was saying, it, we need to take what people say seriously. You, if, if people within a community are feeling, and it, it's not just feelings, it's, it's real experiences, real experiences of racism, of being bullied in schools, these issues shouldn't be sort of diminished to you, you can't take a joke or you don't understand, you're, you're making a big issue out of a statue that no one really cares about. It's probably quite easy for some people to say, oh, leave the statue, it's, it's just been there, people don't, don't bother about it, they don't know about it. But that's coming from an opinion of someone who, you might not be affected by the same bullying, the same sort of harassment that people get on a day-to-day -day basis. So it's a worry. It's a real worry and it's a real, I think it's a drive of anything of people such as her are being appointed. These conversations need to be kept having. And also the debate doesn't end here. I think carrying this conversation in on is a big thing. So yeah. Thank you very much. Um, any more questions from the audience? Uh, there's a gentleman with a rather lovely NASA top on at the front. Oh, sorry, we already had. We'll get to you, sir. A um, couple of, well, it's sort of observation plus question, really. Um, if you keep the statue, could you not have good plaque, bad plaque, and then consult on what you'd put on the bad plaque as a summary of what the person had done? Uh, because over the years, even if we put a statue up now, 20 years' time, people might think completely differently of that person, but they're not necessarily wiped from history. Um, so, good plaque, bad plaque, one thing. The other thing you could do, perhaps, is put a statue up of somebody like Martin Luther King or Nelson Mandela, or yourself. Um, <laughs> we're, we're not that desperate. <laughs> as a, just opposite. As a, as a, a signal of, of a, you know, this is what, this is another culture, this is somebody else we, we admire. Um, so they would be facing, facing each other. Um, I don't know. And if so, who would you put? Who would you choose? <laughs> Can I ask you, Jeanette, I mean, that, that idea of one statue sort of countering another, is that an idea that's come out of the discussions here in Manchester? I, I, I think that's a new one. I've not seen that, but it, um, it's an interesting point because Manchester City Council, the, the one, one of the things that's coming out of this um, consultation is the real need for a proper public um, art and memorialisation in the in the realm as a as a real proper strategy that everybody adopts because I think previously statues have been put up in a kind of ad hoc sort of response to people's requests for uh, and if you know if, if it's coming from private funding sometimes things are put on private property obviously but I think the the, the city council is. The, the point of this is to get a very clear policy in place that makes sure that consultation, because I guess there have been occasions where consultation has just been either overlooked or not, not done thoroughly. And so this means that consultation, there is a proper strategy for putting that in place and it will kind of avoid that, the need for this, that sort of approach, I guess, where you going forward need a good plaque and a bad plaque you need you need that consultation from ev all sides of community and that's that's something that the city council taking forward it's also the case that statues are removed all the time uh, statues are removed because no one rem can remember who the bloke is um, because the road system in a city changes and the the vaults of museums all over the world are full of statues that just sort of people have lost interest in. It seems we've sort of made it a sacred act uh, or a sort of act of violation to remove statues when for most of history it's just been a sort of a thing that did. When this first began my friend Mary Beard pointed out that the, um, the Romans were just not sentimental at all about this. If, when someone fell out of favour they would just recycle the statue, they'd cut the head off <laughs> and put the heads of the new bloke uh, who was in favour on. And so, if you're a sort of, you know, a kind of buff Roman general, you might end up with sort of Nero's body or something. It's a terribly bad, uh, you know, bad luck if you do. But I think it shows the complexities of, of, of these issues that, that we have all of these 
possible ways of intervening. There's another question here, lady. Well, I, I completely agree with the toppling of Colston and the discussions we're having about him. Do you ever worry that by kind of recentering the narrative on Colston, we kind of reinforce the idea that the history of slavery is the history of the actions of white men, and, and instead we're, there's a lot of conversation around Colston, but not the 54,000 people he like, enslaved and the 19,000 killed. Um, and we don't really learn about acts of agency and resistance from people of color enslaved. And again, we're recentering history as the history of white men and their actions. Do you think Is that's that a danger? concern, Joanna? If I might direct that question towards Joanna. Thank you very much. Um, yeah, I think absolutely. The, you, you want to be shifting away from those focus on Colston. You want to maybe like reclaiming, you know, coming back in a way, weaving back to the first question. There are ways to reclaim the site of something like Colston to to tell a much wider history and to tell it kind of grassroots up, ground up history, where you're seeing much more about the, the lives of the people who, you know, the, the huge number of people who also, you know, you want to move beyond also the binary kind of good, bad, Mandela versus Colston, I think is a really interesting suggestion, but what about, um, you know, in a way, telling a more ground up history and using these sites um, to become sites of conscience that tell history um, uh, in a much more multifaceted way, I think. Just to follow quickly, even the language, you know, developing language and working with campaigners who, you know, don't want to use the word slave, want to say enslaved and not even slave trade, because that gives an idea of some sort of equity, which for many people, obviously, that there was no equity. And also what can be a memorial. So again, you know, in Bristol, we're, we're fortunate enough to be working on projects like creating a dance you know, that is dance of the African diaspora, but inclusive and coming together as a city to create a dance for Bristol that can be performed at certain times. So how we actually think about memorial um, for many people goes beyond just erecting another statue, but I acknowledge that most people are still in the kind of statue realm of thinking, obviously people in the audience who aren't on the board with, that, with statues also. Thank you. Um, We've got questions coming in from those who are watching on live stream. Uh, I'm going to ask a question that's come in from Davy, and he says, I wonder what the panel think of Anthony Gormley's idea that the Rhodes statue, the statue to Cecil Rhodes in Oxford, could be turned to face the wall, uh, and whether that, whether that achieves anything. Um, Sadia, could I ask you your thoughts on that? Um, so I think I'll go back to my kind of default position of I think it's important to um, consult the activists who've been for years. I mean, a few people mentioned it's not just been since the kind of resurgence of BLM, but it's been for many years, this history of um, activism, this um, anti-colonial activism and so on. And I think we go back to those people who are harmed. Like many, we've heard many people today talking about the real harm of these statues. And while it might be humorous on the one hand for some people, for others it causes real trauma. Um, and we ask them what they think of those kinds of suggestions. But do you think there's a power? I mean, let, let me ask uh, Rowan. Let me, uh, I personally don't think there's a power. I think get rid of him, topple him too. But no, I, I don't think personally myself. But I'd be really interested to know if those people um, who've been you know, at the heart of that activism, if they, how they felt about that. And how about you, Rowan? I mean, is, is, there, is that perhaps potentially a compromise to leave the statue in place but turn it to face the wall? I just, it's just that I just find it slightly infuriating because I think, I know I mentioned earlier that what, like, this, this conversation about statues, I think, was, is a, a conversation, okay, that needs to be had, but really, like I again I'd agree just topple him also I think turning him to face the wall okay funny but it's like, like he's what, a naughty kid or something yeah like you what are you actually achieving by that I think it's not necessarily about making a compromise having this good and bad I think we need to look at the conversations we're having now why are we even here talking about statues it's because of the real issues that people face today I think I know Right now, statues are the topic of conversation. That's, that's good. It's good that we're discussing these things. But I think that taking, I think taking, to answer the question, I think turning him to face the wall would not do anything. I think it needs to come down. But I think 
we, it, it's about the bigger picture and it's about we shouldn't be glorifying these people, these sorts of people who have and now we're exposed to sort of the horrific acts that they've done. We shouldn't be glorifying those sorts of people. So I don't think it's right to still have them up. Thank you very much. We are almost out of time. I'm going to sneak in one question very naughtily, if I may. The gentleman at the, the front in the, in the black NASA sweatshirt. Uh, very briefly, if you, if you could. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, my name is Sami. I'm an historian based at London South Bank University. And I'm also a member of the Repeal Peel campaign. Um, basically, Robert Peel was a nexus in how we understand capitalism, pro slavery ideology, white supremacy, and free trade. And he, um, in the statue of him in, in Piccadilly Gardens. Um, basically, yeah, I mean, I've been in the forefront of the culture war. I've had people complain to my employer about my campaign. I've had a torrent of racist abuse online. It's been really unpleasant. But um, I'm just wondering, because uh, you're talking about the respondents to the Manchester consultation. Um, I noticed online that the person who was coordinating many of these responses was someone called uh, Save Our Statues Twitter account. Uh, so the other side of the debate, they seem to flood the consultation. I don't know how representative the consultation will be. Is. Um, and also, do you think there's any chance of any statues coming down in Manchester, particularly the Robert Peel one? I think that's directed at you, Ginny. Ooh, uh, <laughs> I, I'm, I'm from Manchester Histories, not Manchester City Council, so I've, I'm not in the organisation, but um, I, don't, I don't know where they're at with taking statues down. I, there is no, there's no suggestion that that's happening at the moment. Um, I don't really want quoting on anything because obviously this consultation is still part way through. It's, um, it, you know, it's still being carried out. There's still the, um, a lot of work to be done on this. So, you know, I guess watch this space on how that dialogue kind of, uh, falls through. But at the moment, that's not something that's been formed part of this consultation. And just out of interest, other than Robert Peel, who else did you have your eye on? Uh, just in, Peel, in, I thought. Just it, Peel. Because my focus is on one statue. There's many relieved better. statues out there. It's just, just Peel. Thank He's you. the worst. <laughs> <laughs> I'm, trying, I'm trying to chair, so I, I, I won't say my opinions about Robert Peel. Thank you very much for all of the questions. Thank you very much to our audience. And thank you to our panel Ray, Fabio, Ray, Joanna, Denise, and Peel.